there seemed to have been some confusion at one point as to who the speaker <laughs> even was for the month of January. <laughs> but uh, the originally scheduled speaker is clearly not with us this evening. But one of our own has graciously agreed to step in and speak to us this evening. As, as we had last month with Dennis, who I would just like to say one more time, I think he, he really did a phenomenal job. Stepped up. He was on free soil this time. <laughs> he did a great free job. So he did an excellent job last month. No, one of our own again tonight, Mr. Robert Girardi, retired Chicago police detective, earned his graduate degree in public history from Loyola University, where I graduated from as well, the same program. Um, he's a past president of the Chicago Roundtable here, past vice president of the Salt Creek Roundtable, the winner of the Nevins Freeman Award on behalf of our roundtable here. He's a fellow of the Company of Military Historians. He's an associate member of the Sons of Union Veterans. He's on the editorial board of the Journal of the Illinois State Historical Society. He also worked on an exhibit for the Bureau County Historical uh, Museum in Princeton, Illinois, which unfortunately I couldn't get in the door to actually see it, but I did attempt to go there for you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, several publications that he's worked on, some of which are here this evening, so if you haven't taken a look, uh, please do so. And uh, the only negative note I could find is that unfortunately he's a Cubs fan, but I guess you know, he would be perfect. Um, for this evening, but, uh, no, he has, he's been a great research partner for me, opening his, his amazing library to me, uh, which has been a great benefit to me, and he's, and he's been a great friend to myself, as well as I think everybody in this roundtable. So, Mr. Robert Girardi. Hello, thanks. Thanks for coming out, and watching me play in my favorite field. Uh, ironically, I'm the player to be named later tonight, just like I was 22 years ago the first time I spoke to the round table when the speaker decided to go have open heart surgery or something like that. And, and Chuck Bednar could find nobody else, so he drafted me. And not knowing any better, I said, OK. <laughs> the amazing thing is I know better now, and I said, OK, anyway, to Jonathan. So. But 22 years ago, I was the player to be named later. I am again tonight, and in 10 days, I'll be again in St. Louis because their speaker canceled, and word must have got out that they had a gullible fool, and so they got me. <laughs> Anybody here been to Galena, Illinois? Okay. Galena is one of our gems, and it boasts their nine Civil War generals. And tonight, we're going to talk about this man, John Eugene Smith. This is a portrait, a post-war portrait of Smith that hangs in the Galena historical site. You can see he's got his Grand Army of the Republic badge on his coat. It's a horrible painting, but it's a great picture. Uh, uh, hopefully, if I ever finish a book, it'll be the cover of it. John Eugene Smith came to me by way of a long convoluted path, but his great-great-grandson put his papers and Civil War letters and Indian War papers in my hands to do something with because the prior custodian didn't. And so when I finish the book I'm working on, I'll finish this book, which I'm also working on, and we'll be done. But today we're going to talk about this man whom everybody knows a John Smith from somewhere. Galena liked the name so much they sent two John Smiths to the war. But this man here that we're going to hear, learn about tonight is probably one of the most important people you don't know much about because of his connections and because his behind-the-scenes uh, activities and so we'll see that of the nine generals from Galena, most of them probably wouldn't have gotten anywhere without this one. And we'll see if the remote works. Does it? No, it's not working. The batteries. Well, we'll do it this way. Maybe. Hmm? Bad luck. If it wasn't for bad luck, I wouldn't have any luck at all. <laughs> Why is this not responding? OK, well, anyway, so we'll see what happens. It'll probably jump 15 slides when we get there. 
I do have some backup batteries. So, would, would, well, would you go through here? Well, it's not even working off the computer key, so it's probably some connectivity issue. Uh, I do not know. But anyway, the show must go on. So, Galena, Illinois, which you can't see here, as well as the, uh, the iron ore, Galena, which is 87% lead and 13% sulfur, uh, in its purest form, sometimes has a strain of silver in it, and uh, in Galena, Illinois, northwestern Illinois, extreme corner of the state, was the purest form of this metal uh, anywhere. And Galena, it put Galena on the map. Uh, between 1827 and 1850, Galena, Illinois, was the, delivered 87% of the lead consumed in the United States. So over a long period of time. <coughs> in addition to the, to the lead mines, uh, the town became a center for the prosperous river trade because Galena, Illinois, the Galena River is a tributary of the Mississippi and Galena was the largest river port on the Mississippi north of St. Louis for more than 25 years. So at this time, Galena was a burgeoning, thriving city because of the, the mining trade, but then the promise of railroads making their way there and the thriving river trade, also, I don't know why it's not working, it was working before, uh, thriving river trade put the town on the map. Uh, with a population of 15,000, Galena was described as a substantial place with the large stone and brick warehouses and elegant stone churches, while Chicago was still just a mud flat. By 1858, oh, did it move? What happened? <laughs> well, that's slide three, I believe. By 1858, uh, the town boasted two daily newspapers, a dozen mills, six lumber yards, seven breweries, which is important for this group, uh, numerous brick and lime kilns, a number of, of uh, pottery shops, a jeweler, three soap and candle factories, as well as five wagon shops and three leather tanneries. We'll hear more about one of those in a little while. <clears throat> Galena was home to a variety of men who was going to play, and we see them here now, an important role in the Civil War. Uh, and rise into national prominence. These included a clerk in a leather goods store, uh, a, a clerk of the court, uh, a gunsmith, a jeweler, a lawyer, God forbid. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, and a number of other uh, occupations. Galena would send, they would boast, nine generals during the war. Most people know the most famous one, U.S. Grant. A few could name one of the others uh, without cheating with the slide behind me, but most people never heard of John Smith. And of course, Galena uh, confuses the issue because it sent two John Smiths, John Corson Smith, and if you want to know more about him, you can ask Bruce because he edited his diary, and you can ask me about John Eugene Smith, the, tonight's featured uh, topic. Uh, John Smith was born in... Switzerland, in the canton of Bern in 1816. His family came to the United States, settled in Philadelphia. Smith was educated in the Philadelphia public schools, learned the jewelry trade, and at age 16, emigrated to uh, St. Louis. Smith's father was a veteran of the Napoleonic Wars. He fought at Waterloo and in the Russian campaign, and uh, the, it was a no-nonsense family. In fact, Smith would be one of three Swiss officers uh, that served in the Civil War. One of the others uh, was also from Galena, and the third one was Felix Zollicoffer, uh, who died at Mill Springs. We were, we're not talking about him, though. Uh, Smith set up, a, he, he met and married his wife in St. Louis, and four years later, uh, in 1836, he moved upriver to Galena, Illinois, and settled in Galena. He f founded his silver shop on Main Street, and quickly worked his way into uh, Galena life. His, his shop, Johnny e. Smith and Company Watchmakers and Jewelers, located at number 85 on Main Street, uh, specialized in making and repairing all manner of jewelry, 
Uh, besides selling a variety of watches, clocks, and silver spoons, he also paid top prices for gold and silver, and he had a sterling reputation for doing so. <laughs> In fact, if you look, I'll pass this around. This is a sugar spoon from the John E. Smith jewel shop in Galena. What's he got in his pockets? Uh, Smith's uh, jewelry shop uh, was extant for 25 years, and he was located not far from the Grant Tannery and the John A. Rollins uh, law firm. Early on, when he moved to Galena, John Smith became good friends with this man, Elihu Washburn, and the two maintained a lifelong correspondence uh, as a result. They did each other favors, and Washburn would appoint John Smith's eldest son, Alfred T. Smith, to West Point in 1855. Uh, Smith and Washburn their correspondence is very personal, very detailed, and we'll, hear, we'll get a couple of excerpts from that uh, as we go along tonight. Smith was a mover and shaker. Uh, as a member of some of the Masonic lodges in Galena, he befriended these two gentlemen, John Corson Smith, who was a builder, and Eli S. Parker, the Seneca Indian, who had been commissioned to come to Galena and build the United States Customs House. Uh, John Corson Smith would go on to write this book, uh, History of Freemasonry in Illinois. Uh, it's hard to find an original, but I have a copy of it here. Uh, there's a big hole in my bookshelf right now. But uh, Smith Smith's was in a number of the Masonic, the Freemason lodges. He served a variety of capacities, just like people in the roundtable hierarchies, this, that, and everything for this roundtable, that one or the other. With Smith, it was Masonic lodges. Smith and Parker would, uh, would be good lifelong friends. In their correspondence, uh, there's not much extant, but what there is is very revealing, especially as it relates to some of the cryptic things they say about Grant after the war. Uh, Smith, uh, Parker came to Galena in 1857. It took two years to build the, uh, the Customs House, which is now the post office in downtown Galena. The building still stands. That's it uh, behind me. And they were good friends. Uh, they would remain good friends, and Smith would be influential in Parker's career when the Civil War came. This is the mystery man. This is the, the secret squirrel of Galena history that I wish I could find a lot more information on. Uh, this is Joseph Russell Jones. So you got to figure out a town where two of the prominent characters are named Smith and Jones. Something's got to be wrong. <laughs> but this is Joseph Russell Jones, a very successful, probably the richest man in Galena. This is his mansion, Belvedere Mansion. As you come into Galena off of, I think it's US 20, be before you cross the Galena River, uh, on the high ground on the river bluff is this mansion, which now is a bed and breakfast. Uh, Jones ran a successful steamboat line and was really, really a lucrative businessman. At the uh, outbreak of the Civil War, as a supporter of Lincoln and a Republican, he was appointed the U.S. Marshal for the Northern District of Illinois. Jones would be a behind-the-scenes player with Washburn, Grant, Smith, and others, writing to them all throughout the war. He also engaged in some cotton speculation. I keep looking to find his name in connection with the Red River campaign. Uh, it might be important to me. But uh, Jones uh, would go on later on in life. He would be uh, uh, the president of the Chicago Public Library after the Chicago fire. Uh, and then his successor would be Benjamin Smith, John Eugene Smith's son. No nepotism here. Not in Chicago, anyway. <laughs> Smith was involved in all sorts of uh, activities. It was impossible for him to stay out of public life. He got involved in local politics, and he served in several capacities. He was an alderman. He was the city treasurer uh, for several years, 1858 to 1860. In 1855, uh, he was treasurer of the Galena Agricultural Society. And following in the martial spirit of his father, he was captain of Galena's militia company, the Galena Dragoons. 
He was an early Lincoln supporter, and he organized and led the Galena chapter of the Wide Awakes, uh, especially during the, the 1860 uh, election season. But this is the, what, what everybody wants to hear about, his connection to Ulysses S. Grant. Now keep in mind that Smith, everybody talks about uh, Elihu Washburn and Grant being such great friends, blah, blah, blah. Grant came to, Smith came to Galena in 1836. Grant came to Galena in April of 1860. Didn't know anybody, didn't talk to anybody. Smith had been there for more than 20 years, knew everybody, and was connected to everybody, and had all the connections. So Grant has uh, a job working as a clerk in his brother's uh, leather goods store on Main Street, and John Smith, uh, the door-to-door -door salesman liked to go and meet all the new people that were around and met up with uh, <coughs> Ulysses Grant. Uh, Grant, of course, was at a low point of his life. He had been, uh, he, he had to resign from the army in disgrace, and then he failed at everything he tried to do in St. Louis, and finally came to Galena with his hat in his hand to work in his brother's shop. He was not a happy camper. Of him, John Smith would write, quote, I don't believe any man in Illinois knew Grant better than I did. I lived in Galena at the time. Grant's place of business was near mine. He kept a hardware and saddlery store. I used to drop in to see him very often on my way home, and he and I would generally smoke our pipes together in, his adjoining, uh, in the office adjoining his store. He was a very poor businessman and never liked to wait on customers. The general would go behind the counter very reluctantly and drag down whatever was wanted, but he hardly ever knew the price. And in nine cases out of 10, he charged either too much or too little. He would rather talk about the Mexican War than wait upon the best customer in the world. Well, Smith electioneered for Lincoln who won the election in November and was outraged when South Carolina seceded in December, and then got even more outraged on January 9th when the Star of the West was fired upon by uh, South Carolina troops in Charleston Harbor. The Star of the West was trying to bring supplies to Fort Sumter and was turned away with cannon fire. Well, this spurred, this spurred uh, John Smith into action, and using his influence, he contacted... Uh, the governor of Illinois, newly elected Republican Richard Yates, and sought to have some sort of position under Yates, uh, a military position. And in February of 1861, this is what John Smith writes home to his darling wife. I've been trying ever since I came here, Springfield, to get Governor Yates to appoint John E. Smith one of his aides. Today I, got him, I met him and told him I would name my next boy Dick Yates if he would make the appointment. He said, suppose you don't have any more. I told him if I could do no better, I would make one on purpose. Whereupon he ordered the Secretary of State to issue the commission. So you see what you have to depend upon. You must hereafter call Mr. Smith Colonel. I feel highly gratified at the result, and I have labored hard to accomplish it with the strong opposition against me. Yates gave Smith the position of colonel with responsibility for organizing Illinois militia. His nominal command was a militia cavalry outfit, but officially he was Governor Yates's aide de camp. Now, War breaks out in April, firing upon Fort Sumter and Lincoln's call for 75,000 volunteers. And even in the hinterlands of Galena, that was news. And there was immediate uh, rallies in support of the Union. And even though Lincoln was the Republican, prominent Democrats like Galena's mayor, Robert Brand, and uh, others, uh, lawyer John Rawlins, were Democrats, uh, Smith was a Republican. They held these rallies urging support for the Union and trying to raise uh, troops to go fight, to meet that uh, Illinois quota. Now, at one of the meetings, John Smith banged on the table and said, let Grant, he's the only man here who has any real military experience, let's hear from him. 
And so Grant came on board and made a speech very reluctantly, probably one of his first public addresses, and addressed a crowd. And unanimously, the people wanted him to drill and train the uh, recruits that they were drafting. They even wanted him to lead them. But Grant was hoping to get a uh, commission in the regular army to reinstate his post in the regular army. So he demurred that. And Augustus Chetland was chosen to, to command uh, the Galena retru- uh, recruits. Chetland ran a dry goods store, a mercantile store in Galena's, on Galena's riverfront. He was the other Swiss officer. Uh, he became colonel of the 12th Illinois uh, infantry, which is where Galena's, uh, the companies from Galena uh, joined up. Uh, they drilled on the property. This is Elihu Washburn's home. And if you've been to Galena and you've gone there, you see the big open, they used to do the reenactments there, there in at the, the Grant House, which isn't too far away, and uh, the post-war Grant House. And uh, uh, Grant would drill the troops on Washburn's property before they marched off to war. Now, down in Springfield, organizing the six, uh, the six ninety-day units was John Smith because that was his job under Yates. And this is what he writes uh, about what happened and how Grant came to be back in the army. Uh, Smith uh, was talking to. Uh, he writes this in a memorandum to Eli Parker after the war. What I'm about to read you. Uh, Governor Yates met up with Smith and asked him if I had any experience in such matters, raising and organizing regiments. And I candidly replied that I had never seen a regiment together in my life. After a few moments, he asked if I knew anyone who did know anything about organizing troops. I replied that there was a Captain Grant residing in Galena who was a graduate of West Point and who had served in the regular army during the Mexican War, who ought to know all about it. He then asked me if I thought he, Grant, would come to Springfield and give the benefit of his experience. I replied that I had no doubt of it, as I had found, as I had heard him say that having been educated at the expense of the government, it was entitled to his services. That's something that Mr. Lee never considered. Uh, little aside there. Waskily Webble. The government then said, Uh, The governor then uh, said write to him and invite him to come down at my request. I at once wrote, Governor Yates directs me to request you, etc., etc. And a few days after, Grant came down and was assigned a desk job in the governor's office. And that's how Grant got back into the Army. And then it was with the turmoil in the 21st Illinois uh, that Grant received a commission to become colonel of the 21st Illinois. Illinois. Meantime, back at the ranch, uh, after the Battle of Bull Run, when it's clear that these first uh, 90-day regiments aren't going to work out and that maybe we should get serious about uh, doing this, uh, Lincoln calls for 300,000 volunteers. And John Smith wants to get a commission and get his own regiment now. Having organized the first troops that came in, he wants he wants to play too. And he's, he's elderly, so it's not, he's not the, the youthful uh, man that a lot of the original colonels of the regiments are. He's a little bit older. But he starts, he's no fool. Let's see, I'm in Galena. Let's name the regiment I want the Washburn Lead Mine Regiment. <laughs> and our patron will be Washburn. And so Elihu Washburn, behind the scenes, does all kinds of things to get Smith not only some of the best muskets available, the right, the, the Enfields, but also uniforms and equipment and money. And even though there are several obstacles in the way, in November of 1861, uh, the lead mine camp uh, Washburn is founded near Galena, and they muster in the recruits that are going to form what becomes the 45th Illinois Infantry. Uh, in early December, they get on a train and they go to Chicago where they form up and they formally muster in at Camp Douglas on Christmas Day, 1861. They're still not full strength. It's in early January when they get the, the stragglers to come in. They make their way down to Cairo and they're assigned to U.S. Grant who is commanding the district uh, of Cairo. 
uh, on the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. Now, in this lead mine regiment, Colonel John Eugene Smith, Lieutenant Colonel Jasper Maltby, one of the Galena people, some of the other officers, John Doerr, uh, uh, this is Edward Dominicus Kiddo, who will become Sherman's chief medical director. He's a doctor. He's born in England. His father was in the British Royal Navy. Uh, he's born, he comes to Galena, sets up a medical camp, befriends John Smith. They live on the same street, up on High Street. Uh, uh, all these people are actually uh, Smith's, Smith's son will marry Kiddo's daughter. That's how close they are. Uh, Kiddo was featured. There's that one photo of the Atlanta campaign where Sherman's on the gun platform and there's cannons standing around. And Sherman is out looking this way. There's a man standing this way wearing a white uh, coat and hat. That's Kiddo uh, at the time he's Sherman's medical director. So all of the major players from Galena get into the war under the umbrella of John Eugene Smith. Smith's uh, command will... Uh, take part in the early battles, Fort Henry, Donaldson, Shiloh. <coughs> As Colonel, Smith is a rigid disciplinarian. His troops are going to be the best drilled troops in Cairo. Uh, and they get involved in the fighting early on, on February 15th at Fort Donaldson. Uh, he's assigned to McClernand's, uh, McClernand's command. He's in W.H.L. Wallace's brigade of McClernand's division of Grant's army. Uh, Smith's regiment is acting in close support of an Illinois battery that is overrun by the Confederates and momentarily uh, captured. Seeing the, the progress of seeing what the Confederates have done, Smith mounts his horse and leads his men into combat against them to retake the battery. This is what he writes. I immediately ordered my regiment forward and with a charge drove the assailants back. This position we held for over two hours, keeping up a continuous, uh, continual though irregular skirmish with the rebels. Jasper Maltby, the lieutenant colonel, was slightly wounded in this action. Smith wrote of the fighting, quote, I was so absorbed with the men to keep them in position, fearful lest they might break that I did not think of, it my, of myself at all. Balls whistled around me, for I was exposed, being on horseback and the men under cover of logs. And I believe I dodged once when a shell whistled so close that I thought I felt the wind. I could not help it. It is, a str it is strange that a person can be so indifferent when men are being shot down. My only solicitude was for the men. Maltby, Maltby I do not think, would let out a fart without first ascertaining if there was somebody ready to smell it. I do not think he is grit. The day he was wounded, he flourished his sword and exclaimed, Give him hell, boys, I am wounded. And he leaned upon his sword as though to keep from falling, and afterwards walked off the field. He does everything for effect. At Shiloh, uh, the bloodiest battle in American history up at that time, uh, one witness remembered seeing Smith under fire. Again, he's in McClernand's camps. They're getting overrun early in the morning on April 6th. Uh, one witness says that uh, Smith's regiment was occupying an extremely perilous position. Shot and shell were doing deadly work among them, and men were becoming demoralized, and something must be done to hold them. Taking his pipe from his pocket, he coolly began cleaning it out with his jackknife, notwithstanding the rearing and plunging of his horse as shells exploded nearby. After thoroughly cleaning and filling his pipe, he deliberately struck a match and lighted it. By that time, all along the line, he was being watched. When the first puff of smoke went out from that pipe, such a shout went up from every throat that told that they were ready to, to meet any fate with him. So he inspired them by his pipe work. To his wife, Smith would write, I write you a few hasty lines. As you have heard, we have been in a terrible battle. Our camp was completely surprised on, Monday mo on Sunday morning last April 6th. The fight raged all day and night, and when we succeeded in driving the enemy back, 
Our regiment suffered severely, having 209 killed, wounded, and missing out of 475 that went into action. Our regiment now has but 375 men and officers. McClernand would praise Smith in his report, writing, the 45th Illinois being the last to fall back, only escaped being surrounded and captured by boldly cutting their way through the closing circle of the enemy's lines and joining the division under the daring lead of Colonel and Major Smith. The Major Smith is Melanchthon Smith, no relation. One of the six Smiths in the Western campaigns. So that none of us historians get confused. <clears throat> After the battle, uh, Grant, as we know, fell from favor. He was accused of being surprised and being drunk and mismanagement and all sorts of things. And there was a big hue and cry. Smith wrote a letter to uh, answering a query from Elihu Washburn about what really happened at Shiloh. And this is what he writes to Washburn. I am... Fr I am free to confess that my imagination is not strong enough to endorse all the reports and my own impressions are that they are written by persons in the interest of the parties concerned. That sounds like today, doesn't it? Of, you, of one thing, there can be no doubt of our being surprised on April 6th. It was worse. We were astonished. I regret, however... Uh, uh, although not to be wondered at having the command, the responsibility should be thrown entirely on Grant. The division commanders were to blame. If orders of which there were sufficient had been carried out, it would not have happened. I blame Grant for his praise of General Sherman that I do not think he deserves. I see also that Grant is severely censured by the public for drunkenness, a got up, no doubt, by those who are jealous of him. There is no foundation for that report. However, later that year, uh, after Shiloh, Smith is uh, out guarding railroads and doing uh, administrative things, uh, provo marshal and court martial duty in central Tennessee. And in October, uh, John Rawlins, and remember things that are going on, the Battle of Corinth, and you have Ayuka, and Grant comes under a cloud at Ayuka for disappearing for two days, and there's allegations of what he may or may not have been uh, imbibing at the time, but uh, uh, Rollins gets up a committee of members of the senior staff under Grant, and they take a pledge. They all sign a pledge that they will not drink any spiritous liquors for a month as, as a way of showing their sobriety. Uh, and Smith is one of the signers with Rollins and others uh, for this. Why? Who knows? We'll hear more about that. Again, we'll visit Eli Parker. Now, everybody or many people are aware that Eli Parker is at Appomattox writing up the lease surrender terms. He's on Grant's staff. If you read the reports, a lot of people will tell you that Grant got Parker into the army. John Eugene Smith did. At the beginning of the war in 1861, Eli Parker tried to raise a regiment of Iroquois to fight for the Union. But Secretary of War Simon Cameron said, nah, you're Indians, you can't play. And they're denied. Parker is then denied a commission into the volunteer service because he's an Indian. They won't let him serve. He wants to. He, he entreats to Smith. Smith uses his influence with Washburn, and they get a commission as captain of engineers for Eli Parker, who joins John Eugene Smith's staff as his chief engineer in June of 1863. Well, there's a shortage of engineers during the Vicksburg campaign, which kind of that sideshow that was going on in Mississippi at the time. And the only uh, uh, Grant's engineers, uh, James McPherson, is, is leading troops in combat, and James Harrison Wilson is still trying to, to break loose from West Point. Uh, Grant finds out about Parker, whom he knows, and he detaches him from Smith and adopts him as his own and keeps him for the duration of the war. But Parker would not have gotten in without Smith's influence. Now, maybe he would have a couple years later when Grant became a who, but uh, at the time, 
of its onset, it's Smith who gets Parker back into the Army. Now, Smith is an able administrator. He's a good drill master. As a battlefield commander, he's somewhat lacking, but he leads his brigade through the battles of Port Gibson and Raymond and Champions Hills and into uh, the Vicksburg campaign and the siege. Uh, he's leading, uh, his brigade is in John Logan's division uh, of McPherson's 17th Corps. During the siege of Vicksburg, Smith is, replaces uh, Isaac Quimby in charge of a division. And so now he's taking, he takes division command. According to Charles Dana, who is a newspaper reporter, but also assistant secretary of war, who sent down to Vicksburg to spy on Grant to see if he's drinking or not. And he writes all these, Dana doesn't like anybody. In, in his, you should read what he writes about Warren. That's a different topic for a different day, but Dana really doesn't like anybody. But this is what he writes of John Eugene Smith when he takes division command. Smith has a firmness of character, a steadiness of hand, and a freedom from personal irritability and jealousy, uh, which had a positive effect on the morale of the division he commanded. According to Dana, quote, Smith combines with these natural qualities of a soldier and commander a conscientious devotion not only to doing, but also learning his duty, which renders him a better and better general every day. When Vicksburg surrenders, John Eugene Smith is given the honor of marching into the city with the 45th Illinois leading the parade. After Vicksburg, uh, Smith's division is detached. It's sent to Arkansas to help Frederick Steele operate against Little Rock. When Smith's guys get off the transports, they're not needed. They're immediately reassigned to go and help uh, at Chattanooga. So in November, Smith's men march overland from uh, Memphis to uh, Bridgeport, Alabama, arriving there in uh, early November, and then they cross over the bridges uh, with Sherman and make the attack on Missionary Ridge, uh, which is pictured here. Now, this is the 93rd Illinois. Uh, this is actually how I got involved with Smith, through this painting. Uh, this is Lieutenant Colonel Holden Putman of the 93rd Illinois from Bureau County, from Princeton. Uh, he is killed at the battle. Smith's division is broken up by brigades and, and Sherman feeds them piecemeal into the attack. So Smith does not have tactical command and the 93rd Illinois and his other regiments get chewed up in Sherman's bungled battle at Billy Goat Hill here on, on Missionary Ridge. Uh, Smith uh, has, he's mystified, he's not happy with what happens he wants to go in and is not allowed as his troops, one brigade after another, are stripped away from him. And so in the winter, between Chattanooga and the Atlanta campaign, his command is stationed at Bridgeport, Alabama, where they're going to guard that railroad bridge that you see there. And he's going to be in charge of railroad defenses during most of the Atlanta campaign. Uh, in, the, in the backwater areas. Again, he's kind of old to be an active field command, but this is something that he's good at. He's shown that he could do it the previous year in, uh, in Middle Tennessee. As the, as the Atlanta campaign uh, at Bridgeport, Alabama, at, at one point at the end of May, uh, Francis Preston Blair uh, demands that Smith's division come and join him in the field. Smith at this time is in the 15th Corps with Sherman. Blair is in the 17th Corps. Smith says, you can't, you're not the boss of me. <laughs> it's not the proper chain of command. I'm not going anywhere. And so Blair complains to Sherman who says, I ordered him to stay at Bridgeport and there he will stay until I say otherwise. And so Smith remained uh, at Bridgeport guarding the railroads and coordinating uh, the defenses of the installations along the railway line to keep it open, sending troops where they're needed uh, 
as the campaign unfurls. This is Alatuna Pass, uh, which will become Sherman's forward supply base where he stocks up a million rations. Uh, there's a battle that's going to be fought here in October of 1864 after the fall of Atlanta when John Hood takes his army northward. Uh, one of the objectives is to capture Alatuna, uh, take the forts, collapse the canyon on the railroad tracks, and totally uh, block Sherman from supplies and force him to give up what he had won. Uh, Smith coordinates the defense of Alatuna. Some of his own uh, division is stationed there. He gets reinforcements there. And of course, Alatuna does not fall, and Hood has to keep marching on. After the fall of Atlanta, Sherman does what nobody thinks he should do. Hood marches north. Sherman divides his army under Thomas. He sends him with some dregs and new recruits to go chase Hood, ending up ultimately at, at uh, uh, Franklin and Spring Hill and Nashville. Uh, Sherman's going to march south. He handpicks the people he's going to bring with him just like Grant will do in, in April of 1865, picking favorites to be in for the big party. Sherman is doing that for his big party. But one of the people that he picks is John Eugene Smith. Now, it's kind of funny that Smith started out as Grant's guy, but he almost, after, after Shiloh, he has almost nothing to do with Grant out after Vicksburg. He's Sherman's guy from then on. And you heard the criticism he made of Sherman at Shiloh. So it's a little, it's a little unusual. But Sherman would not have taken Smith if he did not uh, respect him. So during that campaign on their way to Savannah, Smith is marching. And, and I like this guy's style. He, he writes of, at one point, they're marching through swamps. And uh, the water is not deep enough for navigation. But it's too deep to say that we came by land. <laughs> at one point... He marches his men down the wrong road, and Aaron Dunbar of the 93rd Illinois will complain that that damned old man took us down the wrong road again. Why can't we do something to get rid of him? Uh, so he's never going to be uh, he's never going to be a popular guy. After one of these miserable days on the road, he comes into camp. He's hungry. He wants his dinner, and one of his aides comes up with a cup of coffee and a pig's foot, because everything else that they had was lost. When, the, the comp, when his headquarters cook, walking through the water, stepped into a well and lost it all. Uh. As Sherman uh, advances to Columbia, and you'll notice something out of three of, the, three or four slides, you see these blazing infernos. There's something connected with Smith about that. I'm not sure what that means yet. But on February 17th, on the outskirts of Columbia, when Smith's division crosses the river, he takes up headquarters in the house of a local doctor. And of course, that's the night of the raging inferno that uh, will be Columbia. I'm sure I would like to get down there, but I don't think there's too much of it left. According to uh, one soldier in the 63rd Illinois, the soldiers uh, were sent out to put, to put out the fire to go fight the fire, but he wrote that uh, the, his comrades did not fight the fire with the same zeal with which they fought the rebels. John Smith, according to uh, Dr. L.A. Falligant of Savannah, uh, was staying in the doctor's house, and Smith said to the doctor that it was understood by all parties officers and men, that when the Federal Army crossed the Savannah River into South Carolina, the officers in command would shut their eyes and let the men do whatever they pleased. Kind of sounds like John Turchin a couple of years earlier. Furthermore, Falligan uh, said, recalled Smith telling him what they had done in Georgia was nothing compared to what they would do in South Carolina, for they intended to leave nothing behind them but chimneys. Well, Smith's men marched through the swamps of North Carolina, and as he was sending out his scouts and uh, foragers, the bummers that were going out in front of the army, the Confederates captured and executed a number of his men. And so Smith wanted to put a stop to it. And 
if you read his reports in the official records, when his men captured a like number of Confederates, they marched them out between the lines, lined them up, and executed them in front of, in, in plain view of the Confederates that, uh, in, in their front. And that put a stop to these activities. Sherman and the War Department sanctioned Smith's actions uh, doing this. But it, it put an end to the bummers getting uh, summarily executed when they were caught. At Smith's division fights in the battles of Aversboro and Bentonville, and he's present at Bennett Place when news comes of the surrender that Johnston is surrendering to Sherman. One of Smith's men sees the general come tearing down the road on his horse, whipping his hat and yelling and cheering, and they think he's drunk because they've never seen him smile. And he's ecstatic with the news that the war is really going to be over. But he's not allowed to remain with his men to go play in the Grand Review in Washington. He's immediately dispatched to Memphis, Tennessee to become the military governor of the Department of West Tennessee, replacing uh, uh, General Cadwallader, who has the uh, importunity to get captured in his bed by Nathan Bedford Forrest. And so the War Department thinks somebody with a, with a cooler head should probably be in charge in Memphis. And what happens in Memphis between May of 1865 and, and February the following year with the race riots, John Smith is gone by that point. But in those six months where he's the active military governor, he's writing to the War Department about the problems he's facing. What am I supposed to do with these former Confederates that are coming home? They have nowhere to go. They, have, they don't have transportation. They don't have food. Am I supposed to feed, house, and, and transport them? What am I supposed to do with the freed slaves? They think freedom means they don't have to do anything, but I have to house them, feed them, and take care of them too. And then he writes, and, and his letters are, are, are really quite profound. Uh, he writes about these matters and the, the problem of the former masters and the former slaves coexisting in close quarters and the fact that this is, this is going to be, an, there's going to be an explosion. Something bad is going to happen if we, don't, if we don't do something about it. There was uh, much opposition to remaining in the Union and Smith is advocating after the war, it's let the boys go home. Grant wants to keep uh, the army intact to occupy the South, but uh, President Johnson wants to eliminate the armies, and it's a real bad decision to have U.S. colored troops uh, policing uh, the southern cities. It leads to problems. Uh, Smith writes, "Those uh, the Southerners still retain the pride and arrogance of caste. The master race are obliged to acknowledge the annihilation of African slavery, but they cannot conquer their love for an adherence to habit of the peculiar institution. Covertly, they propose knowing not how, and abiding a time they know not when, to again make color the badge of servitude and of oppression. It seems to me to be hardly otherwise to be expected. The prejudices of education and association are not easily eradicated. Uh, it is my opinion that the safety of the Union requires that the armies of the United States should hold, occupy, and possess the territory lately in rebellion for a yet indefinite period. And of course, those are ignored with this result in February of, of 1866. The, the big race riot in Memphis and in other places. Well, after he's relieved of the governor, the military governorship of Memphis, Smith can't go back to Galena. It's like nothing's happening. Galena is now a ghost town. Uh, the economy has changed. Chicago is the burgeoning city. The lead mining has fallen off over the past few years. His jewelry business is failing for the first time. He wants something else. He can't, uh, he's been mustered out of the army. He gets a job as the revenue collector for the territory of Utah in 1866, but he wants to get back into the army. And so he gets a direct commission under the influence of Sherman into the 27th United States Infantry. And he's sent out on the Bozeman Trail to Fort Phil Kearney right after the Fetterman Massacre. 
He takes, he takes command of Fort Phil Kearney here in December of 1866. He brings with him a number of uh, modern weapons, uh, uh, Springfield, uh, the Conver Conversion Springfields, and some supplies for the troops. He rebuilds Fort Kearney, Fort Smith, uh, and he is involved in Red Cloud's war, Chief Red Cloud on the Bozeman Trail. Uh, when Red Cloud wins his war and they sign the Treaty of Fort Laramie, Smith is instrumental in bringing Red Cloud in and getting him to agree to terms which really mean these forts are abandoned and burned down. Uh, but uh, Smith develops a relationship with Red Cloud. And during the Grant president presidency, uh, the Indian chiefs are, go to Washington to meet up with President Grant and the chief of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, a guy named Eli Parker. Uh, Red Cloud says he will go to Washington and participate only he's accompanied by General John Eugene Smith, the only white man that he trusts to tell him the truth. And so Smith goes out of his way, gets orders to meet up with Red Cloud and uh, uh, goes on the train ride and takes him to meet uh, the president and discuss terms uh, for the treaties uh, that are going to be coming in the establishment of uh, the Red Cloud Agency, the, the uh, <laughs> reservations that are coming. Grant will become president in, that's leaping a little bit out of time, in 1868, Grant becomes president of the United States. There's a big rally in Galena. John Smith leads the torchlight parade down the streets of Galena for the new president, accompanies Grant on the inaugural train ride to Washington, D.C. Secretary of War under Grant is John Rawlins. Rollins will only live for five months. He succumbs to tuberculosis and dies, and that leaves a void in Grant's cabinet. The dark horse candidate to replace John Rollins is John Eugene Smith. Grant's handlers and, and the, the insiders think that Grant needs somebody that's a close confidant of his, somebody that he knows and trusts and can rely on, and Smith seems to be, uh, seems to be the guy that can do that. The other candidate is Horace Porter, a, a member of Grant's staff, uh, and a great liar if you read Campaigning with Grant. It's wonderful lies in his book. Uh, a Grant insider is James Harrison Wilson. Now, when Rollins dies, Rollins and Smith were, were friends going all the way back to Galena pre-war days, and John Smith was supposed to be the executor of John Rollins' estate. James Harrison Wilson snaked his way in and convinced the widow not to turn Rollins' papers over to Smith. And Rollins glommed on to all of John Rollins' personal papers. And he, uh, there is one, bio well, uh, recently in the last few months, a new biography of Rollins came out, but really the only one that existed before that was the one that was penned by James Harrison Wilson who, after he wrote it, destroyed all of Rollins' papers. Now, I don't think Smith would have done it in, in our understanding of what happened during and after the war in, in, in Grant's camp uh, might have changed. Ultimately, the powers that be, meaning James Harrison Wilson, uh, lobbied against John Smith. This is what Wilson wrote. I regard Porter as being much the abler man compared to Smith, and this without disparagement to Smith, whom I thoroughly respect. I know Porter better and well enough to believe him to be a very talented, thoroughly honest, true, and incorruptible man. He is a close observer, and withal has more tact than anyone I ever knew. As for Smith, Wilson wrote, I fear his appointment would not add strength to the cabinet in popular estimation, principally because he has nothing but a local or military reputation. Well, ultimately, neither Smith nor Porter gets the job. Uh, this man does. William Belknap becomes uh, the Secretary of War under Grant, and of course, he'll go down uh, in a cloud of scandal a few years later. It's hardly conceivable that Smith would have done as poor a job as Belknap, given, uh, given the druthers. But uh, 
it's curious the, the how Wilson got involved in all this and muddied up the already murky waters. Smith changed over when they scaled down the army again. He went from colonel of the 27th U.S. Infantry to the 14th U.S. Infantry, and he commanded Fort Laramie between 1871 and 1874, although he's not in any of the Westerns. And uh, during that time, uh, he rebuilds the forts. He's really good at, at organizing and making things more efficient. But this is, this is what one of his uh, soldiers writes of him. Smith was a very severe man and greatly disliked by both soldier and civilian. He was quite old at the time I knew him, with gray hair and a large military mustache and goatee. They, this gave him a fierce look. He always wore a military cloak, which was lined with a bright red material. In the corner of this, he would throw over his left shoulder, exposing the lining. And with his gold-handled sword at his side, in his estimation, he was lord of all he surveyed. The soldiers used to say that if by mistake he looked kindly upon any one of them, he would go to his quarters and have his orderly tie him to a post and horsewhip him. That was what the soldiers called doing penance. Some of his soldiers played a prank on him and they cut off the tail of his horse, his prized horse. They, he came out one day to saddle a horse and found it sans tail. He was not happy. In 1874, some of the Sioux left the reservation and they murdered uh, Lieutenant Levi Robinson, pictured here and a punitive expedition was mounted to go bring the, the renegades army lingo back to the reservation. Smith was given the job, and in the winter of 1874-75, he mounted an expedition through a howling blizzard on the plains, uh, brought the Indians back, reestablished order, and established Camp Dick Robinson, or Camp uh, Robinson uh, in the territories. This is what stands there now. After his assignment here, he was sent to Camp Douglas in Utah, outside of Salt Lake City, and he spent the rest of his career there before he was forcibly retired due to age. Uh, he found out one day the Army changed the rules, and I forget what the exact number was, but he had reached that age, and so they told him, you're no longer in command, you're retired, go home. And so he had a scramble to get to sell all his possessions, get on a train, and come settle in the city of Chicago, where he lived until his death in 1897, partaking in many of the army reunions, the GAR encampments, and the, the, uh, the meetings of the Society of the Army of the Tennessee and the Army of the Cumberland. Uh, but ill health uh, uh, f forced him to decline many of the invitations but after his death, he was taken back to Galena, and surprisingly, many of the Galena crew are buried in Greenwood Cemetery in, in Galena. So here's the eight guys from Galena, uh, absent John Smith, all of whom uh, owe some, some debt to John Smith, with the possible exception of the other John Smith, who went his own way. He, he, was, he enlisted as a private in, I think it was the 74th Illinois. Uh, when he left that unit, he went into the 96th. He made his way up to Colonel of the 96th and ultimately Brevet Brigadier General after the Battle of Nashville. I have his commission to Lieutenant Colonel in my Magic Blue book up here. Uh, Jasper Maltby, we heard about. Uh, John Dewar uh, was killed in action. Maltby died as, uh, in Vicksburg uh, several years after the war. This is William Rowley, who was on Grant's staff. Uh, Augustus Chetlin, after he left the 12th Illinois, he was glommed onto by Lorenzo Thomas, and he was instrumental in raising a lot of the United States Colored Troops in 1863, and he was doing administrative work in that capacity. But all of these men owe a lot of their success and are tied with the glue that was John Eugene Smith. And there's only one monument to him, and it's this bust monument at Vicksburg Battlefield to John Smith, one of the most important generals of the Civil War that you never heard of. Thank you.
Any questions? Yeah, Bruce. So the odd thing, Smith doesn't sound like a Swiss name. His real name is something different. Now, that, that was an argument. Uh, it, you're aware of Kirby Smith from the Northern Illinois Roundtable. He's the descendant of John Smith. And he had this argument with uh, none other than Ed Bars. Uh-oh, Smith, he changed his name when he came to the U.S. And, <laughs> and Kirby would say, no, he didn't. But a funny thing happened on the way to the Army. Uh, now, I don't speak German or Swiss. I can't go there and do research, and the family hasn't, hasn't investigated the Swiss side of it. They were investigating the kiddo side from England, because you can read it easier. Uh, uh, when John Smith was born in Switzerland, came to the U.S. in 1816, but in 1866, when he got commissioned directly into the army on his enlistment papers, where he raises his hand and swears his oath on the Bible, you know, he lists his place of birth as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so this man of honor was not above a little bit of chicanery to, to get the position that he wanted. Uh, I agree with you. It seems logical. Smith doesn't seem like a very... Uh, a uh, Swiss name. Schmidt would be much, much more appropriate, I would think. But uh, you know, well, what, 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 what's with, uh, what's with a name? Especially if it's John Smith. Who's going to check? <laughs> yeah. Yep. And in the and in the Russian campaign, he was he was with the with the French. He survived. <laughs> now. Now, interestingly, so yeah. Now, interestingly, uh, Kirby Smith, the gentleman whose uh, ancestor we just heard about, in his collection at home, he has John Smith's sword, his his uh, foot officer's sword, but he has John Bander Smith, the father. He's got a nice ornate wooden box with two dueling pistols in it, inscribed with the name from the era. So those are. Those are prizes. And after the war, Grant will break with many of his Galena friends. When, when Washburn runs for president against Grant, when Gr tries to get the nomination when Grant's going to run for the 32nd term or whatever it is, uh, Grant and Washburn will break. Chetland will break with Grant. John Corson Smith will break with Grant because uh, he asks a favor for his son and Grant won't do it. And so they write these little sniping letters. The one person that never breaks with Grant is John Eugene Smith. And he, he doesn't ask Grant for anything ever that I can find. And in the collection that Kirby Smith has is a gift from President Grant to John Eugene Smith. Now picture a running horse with a flowing mane behind it made of white ivory and an ebony pipe stem in this red velvet bag and engraved on the stem of the pipe is to my friend John E. Smith from President U.S. Grant. <laughs> so Smith seems to have either the nature, maybe it was because he was a little older than these guys, maybe it was because he looked after them or because he brought them all together and did things with them. All of them maintain a relationship with Smith, whereas Grant will break from all of them. Even, even the, the other mystery man, uh, Joseph Russell Jones, who after the fire is the president of the Chicago Public Library and gives way to, uh, gives way to Benjamin Smith, John's son, to be president of the library. When Washburn becomes president of the Chicago Historical Society, uh, Joseph Russell Jones's son will commit suicide, and it's a little bit of a disgrace, but Smith keeps them together. Now, Jones is an intriguing character. Does anybody know what this is? What is that, Bruce? Portrait of Grant, That's the portrait of Grant. Where is it? Uh, library. It's in the Harold Washington Library. When you walk in to the library, if you look to the left, there's a portrait of Grant, and there's one to George H. Thomas. This portrait of Grant, it's supposed to be how he looked after Chattanooga. So. November of 1863. This portrait was commissioned by 
Joseph Russell Jones, who at the time was investing money for Grant Washburn and others from the cotton trade uh, on the river. And somebody that had a steamboat line might have been instrumental in doing it. So Jones is the other mystery man that writes to Smith and the others all throughout this era, but he's not in the army, so he has he has inside information and other ways of getting things done. Did you have a question? Anybody? I thought I saw a hand go up. So anyway, there's a little bit about somebody more than you ever thought you wanted to know, and you'll forget as quickly as you can.